Sean Finnegan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Today we are going to cover gap theories and John Walton's temple idea. We're continuing in our survey of how to understand Genesis chapter 1, the creation account. We've looked at young earth creationism, old earth day age theories, and now today, gap theories and John Walton's theory. In our episode, Will Barlow explains how gap theories work, including the classic idea that there's a gap of billions of years between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, as well as the modified version. After explaining the pros and cons for these views, he briefly explains John Walton's theory that Genesis 1 solely focuses on function, not physical creation. Here now is episode 463, Scripture and Science, part 5, reading Genesis 1, part 3, with Will Barlow. Welcome back to Scripture and Science. This is session five, reading Genesis 1, part three. So this is our last session on Genesis 1. We're going to be looking at three more options for interpreting Genesis chapter 1. In this session, we're going to be talking about gap theory, modified gap theory, and Walton's temple interpretation. And I mentioned a general disclaimer in session four, and I want to apply it again here. I don't have the time to go over every single detail about all these different views. And I'm sure there are going to be details from your favorite view that I'm going to miss. It's going to happen. (laughs) I can promise you that. I'm just here to give you some pros and cons and some things to think about. So again, we've been looking at Genesis 1. Here are the ways that we've analyze them. We've talked about young earth views. We've been talking in the last couple sessions about old earth views, and we're going to get to a view today that's compatible with either. In the context of old earth views, we've already talked about day age and modified day age. We've talked about theistic evolution. So in this session, we're going to talk about gap and modified gap. And although I put the Schofield Bible here as a common source people think about when they think about the gap, I'll be giving a lot more resources for all these views at the end of this session. When we think about gap theory, the first thing I want to say is uh, that people call it gap theory, so I'm going to call it gap theory. Some people who hold this view think the word theory is somewhat pejorative. So just please know I'm not using this with any disrespect meant at all. I just call it gap theory because that's what basically everyone calls it, Uh, especially people that don't hold it, I suppose. So when we think about gap theory, there's several different versions. Uh, One version is the standard, and there are multiple options for how you exactly work it out, what perspective Genesis 1 comes from uh, in terms of earthbound or celestial, or uh, if the catastrophe that happens uh, was caused by the devil or if it was caused by God. So there's, we're going to talk about multiple options under the standard gap. Then the modified gap is called preparing the garden view. We'll talk briefly about that as well. So here is a visual representation of the gap view. So in the gap view, there's Genesis 1.1. And in Genesis 1.1, the whole universe is created. And then some period of time later, approximately 13.7 billion years or so, most gap theorists will just accept the age that astronomers give us. Uh, there was a catastrophe. Some period of time in the past, maybe some people say 6,000 years ago, some people say 10 or 20,000 years ago. There's a a little bit of a variety there. But there was a catastrophe. And that led God to have to uh, reinstitute, reconstitute uh, the earth, or or at least the area around the earth. Some people have a larger view of that as well, but many people can find that to the area around the earth. So here in this view, that window on the very far right between Genesis 1-2 and following to now, that is your biblical history. That is your, uh, if you're a young earth creationist, that's where you'd fit, all of young earth creationism would fit in that little last little bracket there at the very end. That's 6,000, 10,000, 20,000 years, whatever you think biblical history is, that's that period of time. So again, God created the heavens and the earth, that happened in verse 1. 
They existed for an extended period of time, possibly developing the way that science tells us it developed, you know, God possibly intervening at various moments, depending on your commitments to evolution, depending on your commitments to certain astronomical theories. Then something catastrophic happened. And again, there's a division. Some people say uh, that when the devil fell, when Lucifer fell, that that caused the catastrophe, that Lucifer rebelled and, and blew everything up and God had to set everything back in order. The other primary view on that is that, you know, Lucifer was disobeying and that God in judgment wiped out that first heaven and earth and, and in judgment had to restore and start over again, much like some people's views of Noah's flood. All right, pros of standard gap theory. Here are some pros. The first one is, I think a very important one. It takes the word day literally as 24 hour period of time. So if all of creation happens in verse one, that's before day one. That could be a very long period of time between verses one and verse two. And then starting in verse two and moving forward each day, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, they're all literal 24 hour periods. And I think this is a great advantage to this theory especially in contrast with day age. Uh, the other thing is it fits very well with the scientific evidence for an old earth. In fact, there's hardly any conflict with this view in any of the scientific evidence. You could be an evolutionist or not. Uh, you could have commitments to certain astronomical theories or not. There's a lot of flexibility with how you work science in with this view of scripture. Uh, the last thing is I think this is a very big distinction from day age and some of the other views we've looked at in this class is it primarily looks to the text, both in Genesis one and remote texts to reach conclusions. This is an approach that we haven't really seen very much. Young earth does tries to do the same thing. I don't think it does it as successfully. That's my perspective. I think gap does a, a very good job of trying to do business with the other creation texts in the Bible and say, how do we work all these together to provide a cohesive picture? So the first battleground with gap theory is in Genesis chapter one, verse two, how do we translate the word was? So if you have your Bible, you can join me. Genesis 1 verse 2 in the ESV says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. More traditional or, or non-gap views are going to say was is was. It should be translated was. This is a whole sentence. You know, God is, the world is formless and void. God is continuing through that process of creation here in verse 2. It was formless and void. He's going to continue creating. By the end, he's going to have order. So they're not going to see any disjunction in Genesis 1. No discontinuity. What the gap says is the gap says that word should be translated became. And if it is true that we should translate that word became, then there is an implied space between verses 1 and 2, quite literally here in Genesis chapter 1. So this is an attempt to read this section as literally as possible. And we have to make a decision. Is the word was or is the word became? How should we translate this? Generally in Hebrew, it's called the copulative. When the word is or was is talking about simple existence. So like if I say uh, the wall is blue. In Hebrew, we would just say the wall blue. You don't need that verb in Hebrew. So, for example, here in Genesis 23, verse 17, I'll get there. So the field of Ephron and Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it and all the trees that were in the field throughout the whole area was made over. So all of these verbs was, there's no word for was in any of these spots. These were added by the translators. Uh, they're not needed because it was just existence. Now, some scholars believe that to get the past tense, you need the verb. But in Genesis chapter 41, I'm just going to read it from the slide here. It says a young Hebrew referring to Joseph was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. So here you have a past tense that's not there in the Hebrew. So again, 
these scholars who are trying to refute gap theory by pushing back and saying, well, to make it past tense, to make it became, you would need the verb. You don't. The word was wasn't there. So there can be a difference here, a distinction between when the verb is there and when the verb is not there. So if it's simple existence, you don't need the verb, but you might have the verb. And when it's not simple existence, when it shows a transformation over time, like we would indicate with the word became, you definitely need the verb. You absolutely need it. Some scholars, those that think that the gap theory is credible, believe that when the verb is there, it should take on a more specific meaning. It should be rendered or translated became because the verb is there in the Hebrew. So that's sort of the story there. In other words, the word was takes on a meaning denoting change, not simple existence. So if we go back to Genesis 1-2 with this framework, it lends a lot of credibility to an idea that there was a gap there. Now, whether the rest of gap theory follows or not is another question, it's a separate question, but it certainly lends credibility to the gap theory perspective. The other question that arises from Genesis 1-2 is, how did God create? So in other words, when God created the heavens and the earth, it says in verse 1, that's past tense, he created them. So the question is, when God creates something, is it formless and void to begin with? Or is it perfect to begin with? Which view do you want to take? Those who hold to non-gap views will say, that this is all describing a process. By the end of the process, by the end of Genesis 1, God gets to everything being very good. Okay, God gets there eventually. The gap theorist will say, well, here it is without form and void in verse 2. And it created his past tense in verse 1. So if God created something, it has to be perfect from the beginning. So... You can also compare this with other verses to that talk about God creating and it being not to be either formless or void that uses one of those or maybe some, sometimes it uses both of those words. So you can compare that with Jeremiah 4, with Isaiah 34 and Isaiah 45, among others. Now, some of these verses, it's questionable whether or not they refer to creation or not. And that's what detractors of gap theory will say. So you have to evaluate. I'm handing you some evidence. You've got to evaluate it and do some more research if you're interested in these perspectives. Another piece of evidence that gap theorists like to point to, a friend of mine pointed out to this to me recently, and I thought it was very interesting, is that there are specific terms used throughout Genesis chapter one, and God uses a very specific word, and he calls certain things by certain names. So he calls the light day, he calls the darkness night, he calls the expanse heaven, or we could say sky. Uh, he calls the dry ground land. He calls the waters seas. These are five usages of the same Hebrew word here to denote very specific things that God is calling out to us in the text. Gap theory takes these definitions seriously. So for example, let's look at just these first two, calling the light day, calling the darkness night. Can we imagine a prolonged light followed by a prolonged darkness. For example, if we take the day-age view that each day could be billions of years. Well, if you have darkness and light comprising half of each of those longer days, then you could have a billion years of light and then a billion years of darkness. Is that conducive to the formulation of light on the, on the earth? No. And that's drawing from God's definitions in Genesis 1. That's using the text to sort out some of these issues, doing real business with some of these terms. So that seems to directly challenge the day-age perspective. Now, there are some concerns that gap theory has to address, including what we talked about earlier in a prior session about doing business with day four. <laughs> How do we have plants and then the sun? How do we do business with that order of things? And so I want to talk a little bit about these two verses, uh, part of day four. When we talk about Genesis 1.16, it says, And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. 
As an aside, I've always loved the end of this verse where it's like, and the stars. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, oh, you know, just, you know, billions and trillions of stars, you know, <laughs> just that small little thing. He made the sun, he made the moon, and all these crazy stuff. All right. Now, on some level, that would seem to indicate to us that God is creating from nothing here in verse 16, the sun and the moon and these stars. And is there a way to work that out? Yes. You know, God already created light. He could have suspended the laws of physics and he could have said, I'm going to provide light for all the living things on the planet until we have the sun and the moon and stars in place. So there are ways to get around this. Okay. I'm not saying that this is the only way to do it, but I do want to point out that many people have suggested that the word made is not necessarily a synonym for the word create, especially in this specific context. In this context, it could be understood as God working on his creation. And I think that's especially interesting in light of the next verse. Because in the next verse, it says, and God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. The word set can actually mean to appoint, designate, assign. So in other words, this may not be talking about materiality. We tend to view existence from a modern scientific perspective as something materially existing. But in the ancient world, there were other ways of viewing existence, including existence for a specific purpose. So here in Genesis 1.17, this could be saying the setting them in the expanse may not be like literally placing the stars and creating them right then and there, but it could be actually unveiling their purpose. And especially if we think about this from an earthbound observer's perspective, especially if we put ourselves in the context of someone living in the wilderness when Moses was writing this down with the Spirit of God, that makes a lot of sense. Why do the stars matter to an ancient person other than to tell the story of what God's going to do? That's it. That's what the stars mean. To us, there's scientific benefits. We can test different theories. We can enjoy thinking about what it would be like to live amongst the stars, to send people and probes out into space. But for them, this idea of appointing or designating or assigning meaning, purpose to the stars, that to me carries a lot of weight to an ancient person living at the time that this was being written. And so I don't think that these verses, 16 and 17, need to be referring to the creation of the sun, moon, and stars, but it could instead be unveiling their purpose. The sun was unveiled to rule the day. The moon was unveiled to rule the night. The stars also give light on the earth. And again, as an aside, this is, this is just a bonus. I think this light on the earth can mean more than physical light. I think it can mean spiritual light. I think we can see that throughout the rest of the scriptures. So, I think we can get around this day four issue because otherwise what gap theory would lead you if, you, if you take that this is talking about the creation of the sun, moon, and stars on day four from a gap perspective, you don't end up with a 13.7 billion year old universe. You end up with a young earth again. Because if this is where the sun is being created, this is where the stars are being created, then that distant light that we're seeing that we think is 13.7 light years away, that all came into existence a finite, a much smaller finite time ago. So these are the things we have to grapple with. These are the issues we have to grapple with, with these different views on Genesis 1, how to interpret them, how to fit them in the context of an ancient Near East audience and, and all the other considerations that we have from the text itself. Very interesting stuff from my perspective. Another concern with gap theory is that a lot of people think it's a recent invention. Uh, you know, I talked about the Schofield Bible earlier, which was edited and, and written in the 1800s. There was a, a minister by the name of Thomas Chalmers around 200 years ago that sort of resuscitated this perspective of Genesis. But the question is, was Thomas Chalmers motivated by possibility of an old earth? Or did this view precede our scientific evidence? And it's really interesting because... The truth is, is that gap theory is actually an old view. It's not just an old earth view. <laughs> it's old from a literary perspective. It's been around for a very long time. 
Uh, for example, Jewish sources throughout time lend credence to the gap interpretation. I wanted to read to you from the Pentateuch and the Half Torahs, which is a uh, Jewish commentary on the Bible. In their section on Genesis 1, it says, quote, Ages untold may have elapsed between the calling of matter into being and the reduction of chaos to ordered arrangement, end quote. So you have Jewish sources, ancient and modern, that agree that, hey, there could be a gap somewhere here in Genesis chapter 1. There are also ancient Christian sources, including Thomas Aquinas, that mention the possibility of a gap here in Genesis chapter 1. So I don't view this theory, this gap theory, I don't view this perspective on Genesis 1 as being primarily motivated by the scientific evidence. I see it as being primarily motivated by the text of Scripture. So, now there's other things I would have loved to mention. There are other great sections that um, gap theorists will take you to, different parts of uh, Job, Psalms, other parts of wisdom literature. Uh, there's a great deal of information out there about 2 Peter 3. I'm happy to give resources to look into this more. There's a lot going on there. Um, we just have to move on. So what are problems with standard gap theory? Here are some of the problems. Number one, if you hold uh, the view that Satan destroyed the first heavens and earth, some detractors will say that gives Satan too much power, that Satan could just come in and wipe out all of that, that gives Satan too much power, too much credibility. That gets resolved by the people who say that God's, it was God's judgment. Okay, so, so there are ways around that. Different gap theorists uh, have different views on that. Uh, the other one is there are grammatical concerns over was. I didn't get into a lot of the nuts and bolts on it. There's a great book. Uh, Arthur Custance wrote a book called Without Form and Void. He spends like 140 pages. It's a book you can find online for free. He put all of his books online for free. And he goes into excruciating detail about why was should be became. It's like 140 pages just on that problem, okay? <laughs> so if, if you wanted to look into that, He's the source for that. But there are other views on this. And I want to tell you that there are other views on this. Custance is one person. There are other views. Some people are going to say the gap theory is dead in the water with the word was. Again, I'm presenting information. You have to weigh the evidence. Now, the other one is there's no scientific evidence for a reconstituted heaven and earth. And that, to some people, can be troubling. You would think uh, that... Um, that we should see evidence of this kind of an event everywhere. And there are some gap theorists that think that there is evidence for this in a lot of different places. But detractors, this is what detractors will say. Detractors will say that there's not really good scientific evidence that such a cataclysmic event happened in the recent history of the world. Okay, so these are the problems with this theory. Uh, there are also contextual concerns with some of the without form and void sections. Uh, people will push back on using those to reinterpret Genesis 1. Uh, that's another one. Another one is really interesting. It's from the text of Genesis 128, where it says, uh, go forth and replenish the earth, is what the King James says. He's talking to Adam and Eve, go forth and replenish the earth. You know, old gap proponents would, would latch onto that and say, look, it says replenish. That means the earth was full to begin with and we had to refill it. A lot of modern translations will say fill. And mo a lot of modern gap proponents have set this one aside. So if you've heard this before, if you've heard replenish versus fill, as evidence for, for a gap theory view before, most modern gap proponents have set this one aside because the linguistic evidence does lend towards fill, not replenish. Okay, <clears throat> that's gap. Now let's talk about modified gap. Modified gap says Genesis 1-1 refers to the beginning of creation. Genesis 1-2 focuses on God putting order into the wasteland, specifically preparing the Garden of Eden. So nothing in Genesis 1-2 and following is talking about creation but rather it's talking about shaping the garden, preparing the promised land, preparing the earth for people to worship the Lord. So here is a visual representation of the modified gap. So God created the heavens and the earth. They existed for an extended period of time. And then God started creating the garden and the promised land. And again, that bracket on the very far right side, that's where you fit all of biblical history into, where you'd fit all of young earth into. So that little bracket on the very far right side, that's the last 6,000 or 10,000, 20,000, however many years you want to call that, that's biblical history. So that's the modified gap. I want to end today talking about uh, one particular view that I think is compatible with either 
a young earth perspective or an old earth perspective. It's sort of science agnostic in some sense. And in Walton's larger view, he does, you know, science and scripture do interact in his larger view in some complicated philosophical ways. I'm simplifying it for the purposes of the time that we have together in this class. But I do think that this view is compatible with either a young earth view or an old earth view because John Walton is primarily trying to get at what does an ancient Near Eastern person, the original person listening to Genesis, reading Genesis, what's in their mind as this is being read to them. So Walton's view is based on 18 separate propositions. We're not going to go through all 18 propositions, so don't worry. Uh, we don't have time for all 18 propositions, but I wanted to read a little bit from his book about his first two propositions and then give sort of a summary of the rest. So the first proposition is Genesis 1 is ancient cosmology. We talked about this in an earlier session in this class. This is what Walton says. So if God aligned revelation with one particular science, it would have been unintelligible to people who live prior to the time of that science, and it would be obsolete to those who live after that time. We gain nothing by bringing God's revelation into accordance with today's science. In contrast, it makes perfect sense that God communicated his revelation to his immediate audience in terms they understood. This is page 15 from The Lost World of Genesis 1 by John Walton. I think this is powerful uh, because what it says is science by definition changes over time. Our perspective of science changes over time. Newton's laws were once gospel truth in the scientific world. Then Einstein came along and said, oh, well, when things get really, really fast, Newton's laws break down. Or, you know, gravity doesn't work quite the way that we thought it worked. These things change over time. Our views of science change over time. And since science is fluid over time, it changes, God would have to pick a specific science to tie his creation narrative to. So what, what science is he going to tie it to? Is he going to tie it to 2022? Is he going to tie it to 1900? Is he going to tie it to 2500? Is he going to tie it to the time of Jesus? Or is he going to tie it to an ancient cosmology, the people that would have been the original audience? Mm -hmm. I think the answer is this last one. I think Walson's correct about that. Mm -hmm. Later in that same chapter, he gives an analogy talking about the ancient view of the liver, kidneys, and intestines. And he says, Yet we must notice that when God wanted to talk to the Israelites about their intellect, emotions, and will, he did not revise their ideas of physiology and feel compelled to reveal the function of the brain. Instead, he adopted the language of the culture to communicate in terms they understood. That's page 16 from the Lost World of Genesis 1. This is powerful. So when people come to us and say the Bible teaches a flat earth, it's an ancient cosmology. That's why it teaches a flat earth or something that we, you know, we, we can understand it as being a globe now because we understand more about our modern cosmology. God didn't say brain, 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 brain. In the Old Testament, he says liver, kidneys, intestines. He uses their language. He, he talks to them in the ways that they understood at the time. Walton's second proposition, and I think this is another really important point, is ancient cosmology is function-oriented. From page 23, it says, Even staying in the realm of English usage, we can see that we don't always use the, ver the verb create in material terms. When we create a committee, create a curriculum, create havoc, or create a masterpiece, we are not involved in a material manufacturing process. So what this is doing is it's expanding our view of what God could have meant when he said create, create the heavens and the earth. What does that mean? Well, to an ancient person, did it mean material? Did it mean create this table, manufacture this table? Did it mean manufacture this computer? Or did it mean reveal it for a purpose, give it function, give it order? And Walton makes a very good argument in his book that it, it is the latter, that it is purpose-driven, function-oriented, not material. And this is where we have to challenge our modern viewpoint that's so materially based. It's very interesting, very interesting perspective. This is what he says on page 24. In this book, I propose that people in the ancient world believe that something existed not by virtue of its material properties, but by virtue of its having a function in an ordered system. I think that's very, very powerful stuff. Uh, very interesting. <clears throat> to give a little bit of a synopsis of the rest of his interpretation, Walton believes that God's temple 
is the heavens and the earth. And he pulls that from Isaiah 66. Thus, the six day creation account is not a, a scientific depiction. It's not also not meant to be a scientific depiction of the creation of the universe, but rather a description of God setting up his temple and putting it in order. So he's thinking from an ancient person's perspective as they're listening to this text and thinking about the world around them, they would have understood that God was building his temple. Here are some parallels between Genesis 1 and other temple accounts in scripture. You have a seven day consecration of the tabernacle in Exodus 39 and 40. You have the seven year construction of Solomon's temple followed by a seven day dedication feast in 1 Kings 6. And then you also have the fact that the description of Eden and the later temples have some similarities. Okay, there are some similarities that Walton will draw between those things. And therefore he'll say, look, we can apply this temple understanding to Genesis 1. Bottom line on Walton, he wants to interpret Genesis 1 in light of ancient Near East culture and scientific understanding. Not modern culture, not modern scientific understanding. All right, so the bottom line with Walton's temple interpretation is that he wants to interpret Genesis 1 in light of the ancient Near East culture and scientific understanding. The ancient Near East culture, their scientific understanding, not our culture, not our scientific understanding, not the scientific understanding from 100 years ago or 100 years from now. And really what he wants to do, what Walton wants to do is give us a context for the text that focuses on God's relationship with Israel, not with the creation of physical matter and space. So that's what he's focusing on here is God's relationship with Israel and not physical matter, physical space. So when we think about problems with Walton's temple view, there are some problems with it. And the first one is a big one. Atheists love to attack non-literal readings. It shows that we can, as Jews and Christians, can just pick and choose. You know, we don't have to read Genesis 1. Literally, we can just decide not to. Uh, atheists love to attack these non-literal readings, and for good reason. Um, and this second one's a really important one for a lot of us. And some of us may not think it's a big deal, but... Some will think that it is a big deal that there's no clear evidence that anyone has held this specific view at any point in Judeo-Christian history. And so we can't go back to the past and say, oh, this person here held to Walton's temple view. We can't, we can't do that. Just because there's no evidence doesn't mean that Walton's view doesn't have merit. Maybe there was someone way back in time that viewed it this way. Maybe everyone viewed it this way, way back in the Old Testament times. We don't know. There's just no evidence for that. And so like with gap, for example, we have hundreds of years of evidence that people have believed that gap theory is a way to read Genesis 1. That lends credibility to that reading. And so here we don't have that. And so that can be troublesome for some people. And this last one is also interesting because it leaves many questions unanswered, especially relating to science. In other words, you may not find this very satisfactory at the end of the day. It may not be very enjoyable for you to be like, well, it's not really have any, it doesn't really have anything to do with modern science. Okay. <laughs> Some people are going to push back on that and say, you know, Genesis 1 is making claims that modern science uh, has a say in. And so Walton's going to try to sidestep that, but, you know, that may be uns unsatisfactory for some people. So at the end of the day, how should we read Genesis 1? Uh, well, I'm not going to give you a specific view that I'm going to recommend, but this is what I think about. I have three things that I want you to consider as you think about Genesis 1 and how you will read it in the future. Number one, remember who the original audience was. They're coming out of slavery. They're coming out of idolatry. They're dealing with uh, the past abuse, the past issues that they've gone through. They have to be reminded the name of their God. They're transitioning from an oral tradition to now what's going to be a written tradition. And so that is what we're dealing with. That's the original audience. The second thing I would do is consider the text and the various options to interpret it. We talked about several battleground texts uh, in the last couple sessions, but we didn't cover all of them. There's plenty of them, just in Genesis 1. Things to consider. And so consider the text and the various options to interpret it. And the final thing I would offer is to consider the scientific evidence and how much weight you want to give to it. For me, I give the scientific evidence a pretty considerable weight, coming from a background with physics. Um, some of you may decide that you don't want to give the scientific evidence any weight, and that's your decision. But my recommendation is to, to at least look at it, at least look at it once, 
and consider it and decide how much weight you want to give it. I wanted to close this session with some resources. Uh, for Young Earth Creationism, we've mentioned Answers in Genesis and the Institute for Creation Research. Uh, the classical text on Young Earth Creationism is the Genesis Flood by Morris and Whitcomb. Uh, with Day Age, you've got Hugh Ross and Gerald Schroeder. And by the way, there's, there's more than just these. You can definitely find more, but here are some ideas and options. For Gap Theory, you've got Arthur Constance and Jack Langford. And for the Temple Interpretation, well, you're just stuck with John Walton right now. So maybe some other people will talk about it too. I don't know. And of course, we had the non-literal Francis Collins as well. So remember... It's fun to think about these things. It's fun to interact with the text. It's fun to think about how we can fit together scripture and science in a bunch of different ways. And so that's what my encouragement is, just to have fun with this. And that brings this teaching to a close. What did you think? Come on over to restitutio.org and find episode 463, Scripture and Science, part 5, and leave your feedback there. Uh, As I've mentioned before, we are doing follow-ups for each of these episodes, and we'll have a follow-up out for this episode the next few days on Restitutio's YouTube channel. I've got a link to that playlist in the show notes for this episode. I also wanted to mention that if you are interested in learning more about John Walton's Temple Hypothesis, you can listen to episode 152, Why Didn't God Call the Light Light?, Uh, in which I played out John Walton's famous lecture where he really describes his theory in some detail. And then, of course, he's got his book if you want to go into even greater detail on that. Before concluding today, I just wanted to mention also that I've been working hard on my UCA conference presentation, which is going to be on on an 18th century document called The Key of Truth. It's an Arminian text that I think you'll be interested to learn more about. I'll probably be posting on the Rest Studio blog as we draw closer, because I do have a translation of it that is in the public domain and that I can post freely. And I've written a paper, and then my presentation is going to look at the subject from a slightly different angle, more looking at the content and who this community was in the 17 and 1800s in Ottoman-controlled Armenia, and then Russian-controlled Armenia after they migrated. So stay tuned for that fascinating group to discover that had studied their Bibles and came to conclude that Unitarianism was the correct understanding for who God and Jesus are. If you're interested and you haven't yet, please sign up for the Unitarian Christian Alliance Conference. That's going to be October 13th to the 15th, just a week or two out from now, and uh, in 2022, I should mention, in case you're listening to this later. And that's going to be at uh, Springfield, Ohio, which is uh, somewhere between Dayton and Columbus, I think a little more on the Dayton side, and uh, would love to see you there if you can make it. We've got uh, quite a few people already signed up, uh, but we've got plenty of room, so uh, please come if you're interested. Uh, If you can't make it this year, eventually these talks do get released on the UCA YouTube channel, uh, but it's a delayed schedule where where there will be probably one a month or something like that, and uh, so you will have to wait for that. There's no live stream available for the conference, so if you want to get the latest and hear all the presentations, both the scholarly stuff and the more practical workshops... You're going to have to come in person. We'd love to see you there. Well, that's it for me for today. If you'd like to support Restitutio, you can do that on our website, restitutio.org. I'll see you next week. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.